I'm with Kalman Samuels from Shalva. Now, Kalman, what is Shalva? Shalva is an organization that my wife Malki and I set up 28 years ago as a result of our son Yossi being injured by a faulty DPT vaccine in Jerusalem at the Public Health Center. Shalva means peace of mind, and as I will explain, that's what we try to do. When we started and why we started As mentioned, my son was injured at the age of 11 months by a faulty DPT vaccine. Many children were injured in a six-month period here in Israel until they finally got rid of it. And our life changed. Let me just go back a little bit. I come from Vancouver, Canada, a totally non-religious kid. And as a matter of fact, my first political act in life was standing, sitting on my mother's shoulders on a main street in Vancouver, Canada, waiting for the new young queen to come to initiate the British Empire Games in 1954. So it's funny how London and England is very much part of British Columbia. At the age of 18, I was on my way to France to study. I had scholarships. I had basketball scholarships as well. And my mother asked me to visit Israel for two weeks en route. So I first went to England and saw jolly old England, came to Israel for two weeks, and something struck me here, making me realize, actually I was standing on a beach just south of Elat, and what was Egypt, and across the Gulf of Aqaba I saw Saudi Arabia, to my right, to my right, I saw Saudi Arabia. Directly in front of me, I saw Jordan. To my left, of course, was Israel. And I suddenly began to think about the fact Vancouver is an extraordinary place to grow up, but maybe it really isn't the center of the world the way I had thought it was growing up. Maybe this place with its civilizations going back thousands of years is something I should be studying more seriously. So I changed my plans and decided I would take the summer, and study in Israel and try to understand what was getting at me. And a summer turned into another year. I slowly became religious, uh, and I realized that what I really wanted to do was to study and become a, a rabbi and be knowledgeable in our texts. Met my wife, Malki, en route, got married, had a beautiful daughter, had a beautiful son, Yossi, And as mentioned, he was injured. And when that happened, our young lives got flipped on their heads. And there was no one who could really help us. To make matters worse, the medical world, the government shut down any medical information that was available because it was vaccine-related. And so we couldn't even get clear medical advice. We traveled to New York, where my uncle was a significant doctor, and he put us in contact with you know, extraordinary neuro-ophthalmologists and people because Yossi's eyes were, were rolling and we learned he'll never see again. We learned his hearing is damaged and ultimately two years later his hearing was gone. So now you're sitting with a blind, deaf child and we were in New York for five years trying to help him. I went into the computer field while there and well-meaning people would sometimes come to my wife for a visit, poor Malki, trying to deal with this child, and would at the end of the conversation suggest that you must get this child out of the house. You cannot go on living this way. And at night, Malki would cry. And when she cried, she would always say, God, I'm not putting Yossi out of the house. I am going to keep him as long as I'm alive. And I can only promise you this, that if you ever decide to help my Yossi, I'm going to dedicate my life to helping other mothers dealing with similar issues of their own and crying along with me. So I used to hear this. We came back to Israel five years later. I went into the computer field here, and we had a family of six children, Yossi being number two, and we enrolled him in the deaf school. And in the deaf school, there was an extraordinary teacher, deaf herself, who sat him next to a table and put one palm on the table, and in the other palm she spelled Hebrew symbols for the five letters that spell the word table in Hebrew, which is shulchan. And after 
I don't know how long, if it was a day or two days or three days, she suddenly noticed that he had a broad smile from ear to ear. And she had the smarts to know that he just had a breakthrough to communication, very similarly to the famous Helen Keller. Blind, deaf, with her it was the word water at a similar age, with him it was the word table. And Yossi was off to the races. He learned the 22 letters of the Hebrew ABC. He learned how to sign and to understand that this was called the table and this is called the chair, etc. And on the basis of that work, an amazing young speech therapist crawled into his mouth for two years and taught him how to speak Hebrew. So now you have a child who you can speak to by spelling in the palm of his hand very easily, 22 letters, it's not hard to learn. And he can speak back with sign, but more importantly, he can speak. Now, granted, he did speak with a Cockney accent. You had to get used to that. But once you got the accent, as you know, you begin to understand the language. And Yossi became very, very well known. Uh, He became known as the Helen Keller of Israel, and he was hosted by the president of Israel. He was later hosted by many other famous people, including the president of the United States, George Bush. And uh, he became a wine taster, rides horses. And right after this breakthrough, Malki sat me down and said, it's payback time. I made a promise. I know exactly what I want to do to help people, and I need your help. I was only too game to try and help her, but I realized it required money. And it took me three years till I finally found a dear friend in Vancouver who would give us seed money to start renting an apartment and hiring two staff and beginning to open one after-school program. The goal initially was to lengthen the day of parents. When a child goes to a special needs school, Israel or anywhere else, uh, certainly in those days, school was over for youngsters of six, seven, or eight, probably at one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon. So a little bit older, it might have been three o'clock, But the day wasn't full, and when that child came home, we knew that mommy was absolutely taken. She has other children. The siblings don't have time to see mommy because she's busy with the child with disabilities, and rightly so, and she certainly can't work full time. In bottom line is, is that there's no different, there's no question, there's a serious challenge here for that family. So the first program was to extend the day from one in the afternoon till 6 p.m. So the school bus, rather than bringing the child home, brought them to our center. And we had a nice garden apartment that we rented initially. Later, we expanded it to the garden apartment next door as well in the initial years. And from that initial program, Shalva grew in leaps and in bounds. And if I can fast forward 28 years, we have become the largest and most advanced center in Israel for people with disabilities from birth all the way through life. It starts, we have created on land given to us by the government in the heart of Jerusalem, seven acres of land. We've created a 220,000 square foot, 22,000 square meter center with facilities that have not been seen. We're talking about the sports center with semi-Olympic pool, with a large therapy pool, with a fitness center, with a beautiful gym. We're talking about an auditorium that kids can put on shows, 340-seat auditorium that is very high-end. We're talking about programs that start with mummy, me and my mummy. Mummy comes with a baby she just gave birth to, and the program is not just for the baby and therapy. The program is almost primarily to help mummy get back on her feet. And mummy and her baby get five therapies once a week, full day when they come here, and they have coffee and cake with other mothers, and they are able to realize that I'm not alone because it's the loneliness that kills, and mummy gets back on her feet. And it's called me and my mummy, even though daddies often come, because our feeling is that if mummy is functioning, that family will make it. If mummy is not functioning, that family is going to have a very difficult time 
making it. Now, out of that grew uh, daycare centers for one to three, preschools from four to six, and then you come back to the after-school program, which is from six, one to six. The difference is, and overnight, we also have respite in which a segment, 40 children of those who come in the afternoon, sleep every night, each night a different group. So if Johnny's coming on Monday morning and stays over Monday night, what that means is mommy does not see him till Tuesday night because the school bus picks him up here in the morning, brings him back on Tuesday afternoon, and only Tuesday night does he arrive home. That break of 36 hours, two functional days and a functional night, is a gift that I think only someone who's experienced the incessant pressure can truly appreciate. I can tell you that if there's any single program that Shalva presents that I would have loved to have had raising Yossi, it would be this one, because it's a sanity saver. So today the numbers have changed. We service 2,000 people a a week. We have in Shalva 100,000 visitors a year who are healthy, typical people coming to Shalva for a cafe that is probably the best Italian cafe in the city. For events, the Prime Minister was here last week, and he had 300 journalists visiting. They rented our auditorium. The food was catered by our cafe. So they didn't come specifically to see the Shalva kids, but they interacted with them. We call this reverse inclusion, creating a situation where typical people want to be there, and you now have like just a regular life at hand, but it's a life where the kids with disabilities are working in the cafe, are doing many other things. They don't, they don't even get excited about seeing all these people, and the people who come get over it very quickly as well, that, gee, this is an amazing place, the beauty of which is so off the charts and so clean and pristine that people say, hey, I want to be there. Wow, amazing. What sort of disabilities do you have coming here? We have every kind of disability you can possibly think of. This begins with Down syndrome, which is quite prevalent, Fragile X, autism, CP. There's almost nothing that you can mention, even things like progeria, which are terminal illnesses. We don't see that often, but we have our third and fourth case since we opened. And sadly, these children will not make it past 24, 25 years of age. But most of the kids, we have children that are also challenged in in severe situations with wheelchairs, but really difficult situations from a young age. So we're caring for everything that you can think of. With all this number of people that you have here, you must need a lot of volunteers. So do you have a lot of volunteers? Yes. And do you have uh, people coming, instead of going into the army, do they come and they volunteer here as well? They do. And we have an amazing set of volunteers. We couldn't operate this place without the army of volunteers that come. The volunteers are high school kids who come once a week. They'd love to come more, but we can't get in the way of their education. And they fall in love. And they are in the after-school program where they're working with peers. So it's amazing inclusion where healthy, typical young people are working with children of their age. And we have about 180 a week. Over and above that, there's an institution in Israel which is basically a Peace Corps. It's designed for young women who there's a mandatory army service and they do not want to go to combat they want to serve their country, so they serve in a Peace Corps, which they serve for two years, and they're recognized by the army, and they serve in things like hospitals, Shalva. We're one of the biggest partners in this program in the area that we work in, and we have 75 such young ladies and six young men who, for medical reasons, couldn't go to the army but wanted to do volunteer work, and they are a source of of hands-on and we train them very quickly and very thoroughly all through the year as well so that they become literally semi-professionals but 19 year olds with endless energy that help make this place work i would not be able to afford what we do 
without the addition of the volunteers and the Peace Corps. Uh, independent of that, we have almost 400 employees. So it's a large budget. It's a $12 million budget. The government gives us fees for services. And with some income, you know, we generate about $6 million. But yours truly has to, you know, get around wherever he goes three months a year and make sure that I raise the $6 million delta. Do the clients that come here, do they actually pay to be here? The clients all pay. The nice thing is, is that the government gives us today fees for services for every child almost in this program. So if, for example, in the afternoon program, just throwing out numbers, the government gives us $300 a month for the child. Now, that's a joke because it costs us, you know, probably $10,000 a year. But the family is assessed and billed by the government, and they participate at the level of their income for what the government is giving. So every family is paying, but because of the fact they're paying the government and they're not paying directly to us, and we don't have to get involved and say, sir, may I see your finances, it creates an extraordinary positive environment of love rather than of anything business-related. What sort of projects do you run, do you work with? We run a huge array of projects here. I mean, first of all, in terms of what the kids do here, we're talking about, let's say, the after-school program. They are running every kind of, whether it be art, music, endless activities here, animal therapy. We have four multi-sensory rooms on the on the premises. Let me give you an example of one very, very successful project. Thirteen years ago, I founded a Shalva band, and I hired someone who said he could do it, a music therapist, and he began. And he began selecting young children who seemed to have musical talent and trying to teach them. It's now 13 years later. That band has eight members in it, it, is tra- it has traveled the world called the Shalva Band. It has played in London, in England twice, and at many schools in London. As a matter of fact, six weeks ago, I was privileged to be at none other than Eton College, and there was a evening where the Shalva Band was the entertainment, and it was absolutely extraordinary. So they really are recognized and get around. This last summer, we were invited, when I say we, I mean the band was invited to participate in an Israeli television show, which is basically like America has talent, England has talent, The Voice, and the band entered this competition. The winner of this particular television competition is automatically the Israeli representative to the Eurovision, which is seen by hundreds of millions. Last year... A, an Israeli woman won the Eurovision. So the Eurovision is in Israel next May. The band opened the first challenge on air. They sang Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles, and the judges and the crowd went wild. And as the judges said, we were concerned that we'll have to judge you with somehow a lighter hand. We'll have to sort of, well, we have to give them a little bit more credit. In spite of the fact that our music director said, we're equals among equals, we make it, we don't make it, we're not interested in any sympathy. We're musicians, if we're good, that's fine. If we're not good, that's also fine. And they got immediately, I think it was a 91 or a 94, which is a huge, huge, huge. And the video of the Shalva Band in what's called the Rising Star Competition has gone viral, and it's had something like two million hits with this Beatles song and the interviews, you know, before and after. So that's one project. Why do I mention it? Because it's changing the world. It is impacting the way people view disabilities in a very different way. It is empowering families with children with disabilities to know, hey, I don't have to give up. These kids have disabilities and they're making their mark. My kid has a disability. Let's push it a bit further. Let's let's not lose hope and let's realize that he may not be able to do everything everybody else does, but he may have a very, very meaningful role that he can 
he can make. Apart from that, we have a Shalva team in the marathon. There's a Jerusalem marathon, and runners come from all over the world to run in the marathon and raise money for Shalva. And we have about 400 kids that partake in a particular track of that marathon, a short track. And we began that track with 15 kids eight years ago. And today, I'm very happy to say there are thousands of people who are challenged, whether that be physical, whether it be from whatever it might be, that they and their escorts run on that track. So it's become something very international in nature. Sports is very important because you also have a basketball team and you do judo as well. We have several basketball teams and they play and are totally inclusive in the local professional team, which is called Hapoel Yerushalayim, the Poel team of Jerusalem. And we work hand in hand with them in a very professional way. So the youngsters have a trainer, they have uniforms, they play in a league that we set up, and it's very, very exciting. On the judo end, there's another fascinating story. Two years ago in Rio de Janeiro, an Israeli young man by the name of Ori Sasson won the bronze medal in judo. He came back to Israel, and he decided that he was going to donate the suit with which he, well, that he wore it, when he won the competition to Shalva. We then auctioned it off, raised a lot of money for that suit. The person who bought it donated it back, so it's on show in the sports department. It's on the wall there. And we began with those funds under Ori's direction, a judo program for our kids. Now, one of the sets of children we have here is a group of 50 youngsters who are not mentally challenged, but are environmentally challenged. They're kids that grew up in homes that are very, very challenged homes, socially and economically, and every home has its own story that's very sad. And the children over the years have become environmentally impacted, damaged. And we were asked by the government to create a program for them. We did. And one of the extraordinary things that they enjoy is judo. And they are working at this on a regular basis. They, Many of them already have their first belt. I believe it's a yellow belt. And uh, when the European Judo Championships were here, they actually put on a display that was televised all over Europe as to their skills. So we try and make something out of everything. Uh, just to explain, you also have a basketball court here, indoor basketball as well, and you also have a, an indoor swimming pool as well. Tell us a bit about the swimming pool. The swimming pool is an indoor magnificent semi-Olympic pool, 25 meters, and it is full morning, noon, and night. Approximately 2,000 kids swim there each week, and that's not just the 2,000 kids I'm mentioning. Some of those kids can't swim, but from we bring from the outside other people with disabilities who use that pool. We have another magnificent pool that is warmer, a bit smaller. It's a therapy pool, and that's where mothers and their babies go when they first come to the program and, of course, thereafter. And it's often in that pool when mommy is working with a therapist and five other mothers are there with her in the pool that she erupts into emotion and suddenly realizes this is my baby, this is not someone else's child, and begins to bond in very emotional ways. But independent of that particular situation, it's used by all the preschoolers where you need a bit warmer pool. The larger pool is a regular temperature, and that pool as well is used from morning to night. The gymnasium is beautiful, full-size gymnasium, and it again is used at all hours. No, you are Orthodox Jew. Is it just for Orthodox Jews here, or do you have interdenominational uh, people coming? I happen to be an Orthodox Jew, but this place was set up with a creed, with a vision that nobody will ever be turned away. You have money and you can help us, that's wonderful. You don't have, that's also wonderful. First come, first serve. The second was, we do not care 
who you are. We care about one thing. Can we help you? If we can help you, this is totally non-denominational. And we have, it's in Hebrew, so yes, a lot of the Israelis are Jewish, but that is not why they were accepted. We have some Arabs, who some of them are Christian, some of them are Muslim. Uh, this is open to anybody who needs our services. And that's just bringing people together as well, isn't it? It's breaking down barriers in the most amazing, amazing way. And it works on all sides. It works, you know, on the Jewish side, staff and children interacting with people who are not Jewish, who are Arab, Christian, Muslim, what have you. And it works on the other side as well. When you have a child who comes from an Arab community that is completely Arabic, the child doesn't speak Hebrew altogether, and the parents come in their full dress, and they're received royally, that impacts. When they go back to their community and they hear somebody saying that one thing or the other, they are not going to be able to stand idly by. They're going to say, not everyone is like that. And similarly, on the other side, I think what breaks down and what damages our societies is, of course, stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And that's what prejudice is all about, that a person who looks like this is like this. And as we know, nothing could be further from the truth. Now, when you come into the building, you see artwork of uh, great butterflies. And throughout the building, you see butterflies. What's the significance of the butterfly here? The butterfly is an interesting story. The entire building was built, designed externally, internally, by wonderful professionals, great architects. But it was my wife whose touch is in every detail of this building. The butterfly she put in a 25-foot atrium, a very beautiful mobile, coming down some, I believe it's 10 meters, and, and designed and built by a very, very important Israeli artist by the name of David Gerstein. And butterflies became the motif. The reason for that is, as Malki said, a butterfly starts life in a cocoon. The butterfly has to work its way out. You cannot help that butterfly work its way out. If you try, you help it open it up, you're going to kill it. The butterfly, via its, ec its efforts to get out, somehow, miraculously with God's wonders, learns how to fly. Our children, she says, are in the same situation. They start life early on with severe challenges. We can't do the work for them. We can provide an environment. We can provide skills. We can encourage them to work hard and fly to the best of their ability. And that is the background of the butterfly. Uh, you also run summer camps. Tell us a bit about the summer camps. Summer camps run July and August. Schools are either out. In the case of kids with disabilities, July is usually a more fuller month. But we have day camps all through July and August. And we have a eight-day sleepaway camp in August designed for families to be able to put their feet up, get away, get a break. And it's not just the father and mother. It's the children, the siblings who are all always helpers, always you know, under stress to make sure that everything is done correctly. So we have 300 such campers every summer, and it's a major operation. Do you have any amazing stories from uh, families who've been here and they come back to you and say, look, this has happened to my child? We have it all the time. It's, it's an ongoing process. Just this week, I happened to be standing with a guest inside the front door and a father of a very young girl who's now three years old and began in our Me and My Mummy program was suddenly telling me and the guest about the fact that his child is brought from Tel Aviv every day. He said, when I saw the quality, this is my only child, he says, when I saw the quality of services, I fought with all the authorities that you don't need to bus him, I will take this child myself. So he comes every morning to Jerusalem, an hour from Tel Aviv, puts his child in the program, does what he ever does during the day, and he goes home at four in the afternoon back to Tel Aviv. And he told us that the doctors told him his child will never... He mentioned several milestones, some of them cognitively, 
and some of them, a couple of them, in terms of being able to walk. And he said, the doctor said, this child will never do any of this. He said, this place is a place of miracles. This place has taught her enormous amounts in terms of general cognition. And she's now beginning to walk. That's one of a thousand that I can give you. Have you seen God provide for this place? And has that increased your faith? I have seen God provide for this place in miraculous ways, pushing me to despair and somehow bringing salvation. But at times when anyone else would have closed this place down because of the financial problems, early on especially, and uh, I'm always asked, where are you going, what are you doing? And my answer is always, I don't quite know, because I really don't quite know. You know, someone once called me Forrest Gump, just blowing like the feather in the wind, and there's a lot of truth to that. I try and let God lead me. I mean, obviously, I have to have a plan. But anyone who walks into this building senses, before he gets in, just to see the beauty and the enormity of the Center for People with Disabilities, you know, has to understand that this is the hand of God who's blessed the work of our hands in ways that when we started with five children, we could never have envisioned and never have anticipated. And I'm sometimes asked, you know, you must be so proud. I say pride doesn't enter into the equation. I'm humbled by the fact that, you know, the good Lord has helped us in this manner. Why do you do what you do? When you have experience and you learn the hard way what suffering is about in any given circumstance, and you realize that you have the ability with God's help, to really impact people's lives. Not to change their lives a little bit, but to change them in a way that till this program came along, people's lives were not functional. It's like you know drowning in a swimming pool. And these programs are not an aspirin for serious illness. These programs are a comprehensive response. It's not even about throwing a life preserver to the person in the pool. It's about throwing a life preserver and helping him get out of that pool. So yes, the child still has its challenges, but when your child is here five days a week in the afternoon till 6.30 till he comes home, when he sleeps over one night, meaning two days a week, when he sleeps over one weekend every six weekends, when he has summer camps, over and above all the programs the government provides, that person's life is now has the ability to be a quality life once again. So. That motivates me, that I'm always humbled by the stories that come my way and by just seeing you know, the extraordinary good deeds that are being done here. What's your prayer for the people that come into this place? May they not need this place. May God give their child a full recovery and may they be able to go on to do things that they should become good friends of this, these children and, and come and volunteer. That would be my prayer. But given the fact that they're here, my prayer is that God should help them, number one, be able to cope. Have a little bit of shalva, peace of mind. And that's what we strive for. And I do believe that's what we're very successful at, at bringing people that quality of coming to terms with what they have, understanding the limitations, and at the same time never limiting themselves to those limitations. We always reach further and further afield, never losing hope and always believing that God can do anything. And as the song goes, believing makes miracles happen. And what's your website for people who'd like to know more? www.shalva, S-H-A-L-V-A dot O-R-G. Okay, Kalman, thank you very much. Thank you so much, and I wish your listeners a wonderful day and wonderful health.